Okay, so uh, welcome to another Fredlock in the, in the sky, in the ether. Um, thanks for joining. And today we will talk about how we do networking from the command line, meaning if you are managing servers today uh, that are all running Linux, we, we don't really typically install a GUI to have some nice, easily click, clickly click stuff to do networking. And this talk is about how would you use the command line or even how would you automate setting up networking. Uh, on tons of servers if you need to get there. So I really won't speak a lot about myself. I've been talking en uh, enough at Fedlock that most of my buyer are out there in older uh, presentation, but you know, I've been part of the Fredlock, uh, this generation of Fredlock for more than 10 years, ever since we started it, uh, probably 15 by now. Um, done Linux since way before it was uh, popular. So in the old 9.9 something uh, days, um, pretty much been using Linux uh, full time for about 15 years professionally. So way before my Red Hat days. Um, anyway, um, I am always trying to learn new stuff, but as we just talked about, uh, to me, there's too much to learn. I, I, I need to narrow my scope a little bit in order to be effective in, in, in what I do. And, you know, learning new stuff all the time is fun, but if you need to get stuff done, it might not be the right way to do it, at least not for me. So today we will talk a little bit about what net, how networking uh, works in Linux in general. Um, then we will talk about Network Manager, which is the particular, sorry? which is the particular utility we will be talking about in, in this talk. There are other methods out there, and I will touch a little bit about what they were and are when we do that. And um, but in that sense, once I have given an overview of, of Network Manager, or it's pretty much gonna be nothing but commands and how do we do X, Y, and C. Uh, I have demo systems and stuff like that I can pull up depending on questions. And with that said, please do not wait until the end to ask questions. You feel free if you if I'm on a certain topic that you have questions about, or we can absolutely stop and take a chat about it. So what did it used to be like? Or actually, how does Linux actually work underneath the hood? So I guess everyone here might be familiar with the expression that everything is a file in Linux. And that is pretty much true with the exception of networking. So I, I dare you to find a device file that, that represents your network interface. If that's not, that's all, you can do that with everything else except for networking. And that's simply because the way things are built into the kernel does not conduce that device to really look easily as a file because there's so many options that changes the way that device would work that it just makes no sense. Uh, so within the kernel, we have definitions of sockets, of, 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 of net filtering, and basically how a package comes from the physical uh, electrical signals into a programmable interface where we can actually see the data turned into bits and bytes or to data that our programs can deal with. All that is inside the kernel, and what we need to do is to manipulate those settings in the kernel uh, in order to networking working. And then, and that's pretty much been the case since day one. Um, but it's, it's, it's important to understand that that interface into the kernel to do this is not simple. And it's quite complex, which is why when we go in and actually see what we used to do, we used to have a sea of commands. And I say used to, now some of these commands are still there. You can probably still use them, but part of what we wanna talk about today is how to simplify this world. Because as you go from distro to distro, you will probably find that some of these commands are more prevalent in one distro versus another one. And to solve problems, you may not actually have to solve it or may not be able to solve it the same, same way on a Fedora as you do on a Debian because they have a different set of tool sets available. Now you can solve the problem. It's not like it can't be solved on one and, and but only on the other, but it's just uh, settings. To do. So I don't know who that is, but if you are not talking uh, and not asking questions, uh, feel free to go unmute. That way when phones ring and all that stuff, it, it doesn't go out to the whole party here. So if you are familiar with Linux a little bit, 
uh, uh, I'm pretty sure you've seen the uh, command ifconfig, for instance. That's still, when I do some Googling, I still see tons of guides talking about that. And it's a fun command because it's literally been deprecated for more than 10 years. Um, one of the reasons for that is it's very, very hard to script anything that is based on that command. It can be done, but it's all kinds of weird graphs and pattern matching because the output is meant for humans to read, not computers to read. Uh, long, long time ago, that got deprecated and replaced by the IP command, but for some reason, a lot of scripts kept, the basically said, we don't need to update because IF config is still there, even though it looks odd and it's hard to maintain, we're, gonna, we're not gonna spend any time converting it to the IP. So we literally still have IF config out there, uh, even though it hasn't been developed, hasn't been progressed for a long time. But is the problem because... with IF config is it, it, it requires all these additional tools around it to be complete, where the IP command that replaced it is a single command into the kernel's view of what does the network look like. So the, the, the very big the, the problem becomes if I'm a developer that wants to add network functionality to my code, and I certainly don't want to block, uh, just develop it for one distro. I want it to be for Linux or Linux distros in general. It's definitely not an, an easy uh, way of coming up, but what can I do that makes this work on every distro? There's no consistent API, there's no consistent set of commands, a way to do it, to where to store, read configurations. Everything is sort of like a little bit up in the air, which is why you found that, for instance, some DEs would be easier or actually work setting up networks and others wouldn't, or the distro would update, but those GUIs you were dealing with were not updated to fulfill or to look at the new settings or whether it was new or didn't work. So that really was one of the reasons behind thinking of Network Manager. And it, it, it and the fun part of this is it didn't really come out of a technical, I need to script things. It came out of the, the GNOME group saying they are tired of not making all their plugins work very, uh, for networking. They needed more consistency uh, how to do that. And so Network Management, when you look for the upstream projects, they're all under the GNOME project. So well, if you've done networking on, on Linux, the files looking like the one on the, on the left here is probably something you've seen before. Now, I know the Debian version of the interface is, is slightly different, but it's still the same idea that you have a file per interface setting and then you need to remember what uh, needs to go on each line. And it, you know, if you do a spelling error or something else, you may not even know about it because it's just a variable defined. So if you spell the variable differently, it's just ignored. So this is a very interesting interface that looks very simple and, and clean to begin with, but very quickly in large deployments becomes kind of a art to deal with. Um, making sure that what you actually had in your files and set up for networking and what was applied was also not easy. You could apply it again. Uh, and I had systems when I applied that to the main interface, the, the box stages became unavailable until the network came back up again. So it wasn't just something you could just do. Uh, other times, it's not a big deal. Uh, but anyway, so by having these files uh, and a dumb script to apply them, we really still really don't have much control. And nothing is guaranteeing that the interface or the network settings that you actually have active hasn't been manipulated since that file was run. So during an update, someone may have fixed the problem on, on the live setup, but when you then reboot, then all of a sudden those updates are lost and you may not remember because that was two months ago. So, that, so being able to manage and understand and control your networking is more than just being able to manage a file somewhere, even if you do understand it. And I must admit, understanding the network files, configuration files, I still go to the documentation today. Because I can't remember all the different options. I mean, I remember the main ones, but not how do I set up a bridge, how do I set up pretty much anything, because all those options are pretty much, well, in my mind, keeps changing because I don't use them very often. But it wasn't really bad. As I, as I said, you know, one of the things that 
using the files really allowed us to do with some flexibility. If you really understood how networking interfaces and devices worked in Linux, having a script as the only way to maintain them provided you all the flexibility you needed to pretty much implement whatever network configuration you wanted. The only issue becomes good luck in telling someone who's just starting up with Linux how it works or how to maintain it. So we tried with GUIs and we ended up with the problem we, we, we saw earlier that hey, every, every distro had their own way of talking to it and they were very dependent on what, how that distro actually stored data, applied it, and, and everything else was different between each of them. And we needed, or at least from a GNOME perspective, they didn't really care whether they were running on Fedora or Ubuntu or somewhere else. They wanted a single and unified way of doing networking regardless of where they were running. So this brings me to the network manager. Uh, I want to just stop for a second and ask if there's any questions before we actually get into the meat of network manager or comments. That's fine, I will continue. So if you look at Network Manager and look at the, uh, the, the official definition, it's a little wordy, but what it basically comes down to is it's a daemon who's responsible to work with a subsystem called DBus inside of um, well, most distros today. And DBus is a, is a fancy way of talking about how data is passed from one subsystem to another. So if you've ever wondered how your computer understands that when you hit the, a letter on your keyboard, it ends up in your focus window, it's because everything that you do from moving your mouse to using your keyboard and clicking are all converted into messages that are sent on an internal bus. And then it's up to in, each individual component to subscribe to that bus to get whatever messages they're looking for. So that's how it, you know, the same keyboard driver and everything else works for every application you have, that they don't all have to have the same, their own driver. And the idea behind Network Manager becomes utilizing that whole subsystem to communicate back and forth. So basically, it will, it's, a, it's a daemon that listens to the DBus, and it also sends out messages on the DBus to allow applications to, to talk to and from the network configuration management. It's pretty much all it is. Uh, one of the things that may not be clear is that Network Manager does not care where the settings are stored. That's literally a plugin. And that plugin is definitely different when it comes to each distribution. So typically what you will find is that each distribution more or less hard codes their own plugin or where those initial files are stored. But to Network Manager, to the end users, they don't care. GNOME, for instance, would use uh, GCOMP, which is the uh, GNOME configuration files to store the settings when you go and define networking in GNOME. And Network Manager doesn't know any different. It's just basically being told to go to that location to read your settings instead of going to another location to talk about. So it means it's very pluggable and it's very portable. It, it doesn't really opinionate how the distribution want to do things. It just allows things to talk to one another on a consistent interface. One of the things that Network Manager needs to provide, um, again, if you look at those scripts in the past, most of those scripts were written to only allow an admin to run them, meaning they literally needed root access to, to manipulate the devices that were all system level devices. However, if you take your laptop running Linux and you want to connect to your Wi Fi at the coffee store, once we can go back to the coffee stores, <laughs> um, you know that that's really not what. what it happens today. We don't want to have to log in as root to just connect to a Wi-Fi network. But in the end, that network is a system level device. So one of the things that Network Manager has to do is to sort of protect or wrap those system devices into something that an end user without higher privileges can manipulate by proxy. And that's one of the advantages of having the API because now I can send a command and I can then use a system of authorization behind it that says, do I actually have as a user the right to change this device or the right to look at this device for that, for that matter? 
uh, and see what it does. Um, so you can take that even further. You know, you can plug in your USB device with a either Wi-Fi or maybe even be a, a, a hot hardwired network, and also as an end user without root access, configure that. Again, if you tried that with pure Linux or as it used to be without Network Manager, that would not happen. You had to be root to do any of that stuff. Um, so behind Network Manager to control who has access to what, it uses Polkit. And Polkit is probably something I think is less well known. Uh, I think a lot of people assume sudo is how you escalate privileges. That's pretty much not the case and hasn't been the case for a long, long time, at least from a GUI perspective. Everything that it controls what you have access to today is really to Polkit. So if you've never used it or looked at it, it's it's well worth a little dive in to figure out how that works. And that, so that's what allows you in the GUI to go in and define a printer or networking in this sense or something else that typically would require some system access. It's all guarded, uh, guarded by a simple global system perspective uh, policy setting that, det that determines what can you do as an end user. One, another thing that network manager needs to be able to deal with is system events. So one of the things that the old command lines did not do was that if you, for instance, are, let's say you defined a Wi-Fi for your home network, but you took your laptop to work and then you come back home. The problem is that unless you're booting the box, it doesn't know that you are in a range of a new network. So you had to literally run the command again to either find it or just say connect to it when you got home, even though, you know, without knowing whether that network was around. With system D, sorry, yeah, well, system D and network manager sort of like integrated at this point. But what happens is that when the device is plugged in, system D will send it uh, to UDEV, to uh, network manager to tell it that a new device got connected. Or when the um, radio comes on, I mean the Wi-Fi radio comes on, it will do a scan, and if it sees a Wi-Fi that you already have to find as AutoConnect, it will automatically connect to it when it sees it. So that's one of the things that those system events allows network manager to do is to say when a message comes in from uh, either the kernel or from an RSS system that, for instance, might be scanning to see what Wi-Fi is available, it can take action based on that automatically. So as a user, once I have to find that when I'm in, in range of this network, just do this, or when I connect to VPN, do this, it cannot be set to automatically activate those features um, without having an end user basically intervene. And I think we take a lot of that for granted. We've all used our phones forever, and they all do that. So just think back when we look at the simplicity of the old days with running a simple little script like IF up that the, the consequences of that was that there was no automation on it. And because we need automation, and that's one of the requirements here, it, it, it did require a design change. And, and now part is the last ball here, and, and, and this is something that I think a lot of things get lost when we talk about why we want to have APIs for things. Just because, the, let's say, a new version of the kernel defines a new way of dealing with a certain device. But we've all been used to that the kernel will hide some of those details, but we know that because we, we, we have a kernel group that it fights to keep what they call user space intact and not change, that my code doesn't necessarily see that change. It's just a, maybe another call, but my existing calls will not change just because that feature of the kernel changed. The same is true with Network Manager, in a sense. So when we get new features in the network, all the old ones are not changing. Or when an existing, let's say there's more options for an Ethernet or that we're using, we can still utilize it the old way. I don't have to convince or update my clients every time there's a system change anywhere else. So that allows me to basically develop once and use it on distant distribution that are different life cycles of both network manager but other components of the system without really needing to take that into account. Um, you, you, of course, if you're depending on, on a specific feature, you will have to query, does it exist? And if it doesn't, you tell the user, you can't do that because that feature is not on your system. But beyond that, it's not a 
a big deal for a, anyone who wants to extend how networking works. And that could be as simple as your app needs to know whether the network is up and running in order to run. Uh, your phones do that all the time. And so even though you may not be configuring network, you need to query the network state and be notified when the network state changes. And that's one of the many features that Network Manager provides. So I couldn't find a diagram out there that someone had already done that explained the components of Network Manager. So I put this together based on how I look at Network Manager, not as an engineer that's developed it, uh, tons more components inside of it than, than this is. This is very simplified. To me, there are two main components that depends on UDEF. So everything starts with a device manager. And in Linux, and I, I quite frankly don't believe we have any distributions out there to, that are not based on UDEV anymore. Uh, so I, I'm very happy to say, I'm, I'm pretty frank here saying UDEV is probably a requirement here to make network manager work. So UDEV is what defines what a device is. It's what talks to the kernel uh, to understand what the kernel sees, and it creates the dev file system and a few other things that allows me to interact with devices on the system. It also uses DBus to let everyone know when the new device is found. Um, so using that method, Network Manager defines the devices that UDEV have defined. And a device is a representation of something physical in your box. However, as an end user, I can create additional devices uh, that are logical. And we'll get into that a little bit later. I won't go into many details unless you have questions about them. But the point here is that I can't delete a system device. If there's a piece of hardware behind it, I can't remove it. It's, it's, you know, unless I take the hardware out of the box. Um, but I can add logical devices to the system. And I can, do, of course, delete my logical devices. But to configure how they are set up, how they are connect, I mean, how you, your settings are done, there's a, what's called a connection definition inside a network manager that is tied to one or more devices. Oh, sorry, you, one device is tied to one or more uh, connection settings. So uh, the reason you may have more, uh, again, go back to Wi-Fi as an example, you may have more than one Wi-Fi connection defined. Uh, you may be at work, you may be at home, you may go to your family, and everyone has different SSIDs. Well, it's the same device, but it's different settings every time you go to different places. Think about it like, like that, and you can apply the same mechanism to your uh, physical interfaces on your box. It doesn't change. So those three, and now I'm more components of Network Manager, but they are really just in addition to, um, I would say, a global functionality, not a specific functionality. And I'll cover some of those in a moment. Uh, but Network Manager is about managing those three things. And Network Manager then sends and receives data to the DBus. And I did write GUI clients, I mean clients in general. So anything that wants to talk to Network Manager just uses the DBus interface. So let's actually start looking at getting into the Network Manager uh, command line interface and how that works. So when we do that, we need to, to first think about when we talk about a network device, how do they look on the system? How do I recognize something as being a network device? Um, here's where it may help if you've seen a, if you've ever been to a server that has more than just a couple of NICs in, in the back. You know the problem. Right? Which NIC is what interface? Um, so I don't want to go too far down this road, but I, I got I to mention because the reason I wrote this up was I spent all last this weekend we just came from. Um, trying to hunt down the problem of setting up a new hypervisor that had eight NICs in it. And I could not get the bunding to work. It kept airing out. Turns out, after spending lots and lots of hours and pouring out my hair, figuring out why I would not communicate right with the switch, that I had misidentified what ports were on in Linux corresponding to what port on the hardware side. So I literally had the cables plugged into the wrong ports. That was because all they had was a sequential number given to me by the buyers. And that doesn't tell me uh, when I look at that row of NICs in the back of the server, which one is what. That's the problem with networking once you get beyond, hey, I only have one interface in my laptop, so why, why do I care? 
So we have something called a predictable uh, network interface, which should be enabled by default. At least I know that that's the case with um, Fedora and CentOS as well, et cetera, et cetera. That by default, when you do a real eight install today, that's just enabled. Now, some people don't like it because it took away the etsy 0, 1, 2, and 3, um, or ETH, sorry, 0, 1, 2, and 3, um, and they don't like the new names. However, once you get used to it, the names actually make a lot of sense. And in the end, you don't really see the network device that often. Hey, Peter, but, I've got a question, quick question, if I could. Um, sure. What, what part of, what subsystem, so when you plug in a USB Wi-Fi device, what, what system detects that and adds that, that network interface to the list of interfaces that are now available to you? That's you, Dad. Everything that I'm going to talk about, talk about in the next couple of slides, and I actually have a couple of examples of how you do that in UDEV. But it's all UDEV's responsibility is to create and set up those entries to the kernel in the uh, dev file system. And that goes for network interfaces too. So whenever a kernel comes up with, hey, I have a new device, and that could be you're plugged in a new hard drive or USB or something else, UDEV reacts to that and decides what to do. And it could be everything from ignoring it to setting it up with specific security rights, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It can even spawn processes in response to a device change. That answer your question? Maybe on mute because I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I nodded my head up and down. Yeah, it does. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I took away the video so I can look at my screen here. <laughs> sorry. Okay. So the, the predictable names, are, and I, I will show later, this is all coming from UDEV. Um, but one of the things about the predictive names are that when you have a machine where you change hardware, uh, and, and I must admit, it's something I've done a lot because uh, I'm cheap and I buy old hardware. So often I have to upgrade or replace the old slow stuff with new faster stuff. But if you take a machine today that may have, let's say, two built-in NICs on the um, uh, motherboard, and then you add NICs as a plug-in board, if you just use the old ETH 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, there's a good chance that once the system comes up and sees that extra card and those, let's say, four extra NICs, that your 0 and 1 is now five and six, right? So, be, so this is the problem when we, when we don't have predictable names. When things change, because if the buyers really sees things as they're physically on the bus, and it starts enumerating them depending on how it discovered what's on that bus. And that's, at least from a, 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 an admin's perspective, random. Depending on how the kernel is set up, sorry, the, uh, the, um, the buyers, is set up on that piece of hardware and where the cards are in that hardware, they will be found and discovered at different on different numbers. So what the predictable naming literally does is it is guaranteed to stay the same regardless of what you do. So if you add more hardware later, that interface name that you configured will still be called the same. And I try to sort of indicate that here on the bottom of this slide is, so if you look at the interface name today when you, you, uh, you start them up, they will start with EN if it's Ethernet. And most of us that has a, uh, a wired network, that's what we'll see. Uh, and there's, there's something following it that will come up in a moment. But it can also start with WL for wireless. Or if you're really smart and have a big router and all that, it could be WW for wide area network. Uh, like very nasty connections, but I think most of us will see EN and WL on our systems. And after that can be a bunch of letters and numbers. So in my case, in that server example I had before, because I just used enumeration, it was the O and the number that the bias had found. Right. Uh, in my case, all the NICs were on the motherboard, so it wasn't plugged in. So I know they won't change unless you change the motherboard. That probably won't happen. Um, but I did not know which number, or I thought I knew which number uh, ENO uh, 1 was versus ENO 2. And turned out that my assumptions were wrong. So it's very easy when you just have that number to go wrong. But you can also 
when you go to fully predictable, instead of saying just a number, it actually literally talks about the slot. It talks about the, uh, the, the type of function it has. So you can have different types of network cards in, in the box. It can actually have an ID that comes from the hardware. And they all can become part of the name. And when you do that, it is becoming predictable because now I don't have it auto-generated based on an enumeration when I boot. It is literally looking at the hardware information on that card to generate the name. And it will not change as I add more hardware. So how does it figure out what to call them? Well, so it goes to a like a priority list or a scheme number here to figure out which one to pick. So um, if it can, it will look at you know what the, um, the firmware provides. If it can do that, it will take a look at um, a PCI Express or something else. Um, and if you can't do that, it will go, I mean, it will basically jump from one to another, to another, to another, to another, if it's allowed to do this. But you can disable each of these levels, and you can see number four, for instance, all of a sudden now we have the MAC address. Um, that looks awful, but it suddenly won't change. And in the end, I don't really care about the device name. As long as I, my configuration works next time I boot it, I'm pretty much a happy camper. All of this is documented in, in plenty of documentation about Network Manager and general on, if you look at the rail documentation, all of this is explained in, in severe details of how do you configure each area and why would you choose one or one other and et cetera, et cetera. But the idea again is it's all consistent and it's all done by UDA. Um, what I do like is that because it's customizable, I mean, I do have some control. I mean, all you dev is nothing but files that has the rules that says, if you see this device and it has this ID or whatever, do wax. And those rules I can write myself. Now, the system comes with a lot of rules out of the box. They all then use the lib you dev, something in that sense. Um, but I can all write them in Etsy you dev. And that's really how you can go in and define your own rules. If you don't like the predictable names, uh, right when they came out, I saw a ton of people complain what happened to the Etsy, ETH zero and one and so on. And literally all you have to do is add one thing to the current command line when you boot, um, and it, it disables it. So as you can see, the net IF names equals zero is the current version of rel definition. Uh, I wrote that and forgot all about that it used to be different. <laughs> so this morning I added the, the bias dev name, which is the old way of doing it. And I'm still finding systems, even in CentOS, that uses that. So you may still need to use the old way of doing it. Uh, that said, it's very simple to add your own rules. So you can take the etcd, the udev rules, uh, for instance, uh, and create a 70 mynet names rules that will um, do whatever you want. So if you want to name them, with numbers, or you want to use a specific ID that you grab from the hardware, or something else that makes sense to you, you can set that up fairly easily. And then you can add the uh, net name slot rules, which uh, is where the, uh, the MAC address and all that stuff comes from. On top of that, so in case you don't hit it with your rule, then they will default using the MAC address, so they will still be persistent. So it doesn't have to follow the rules that were set up initially, and I think Red Hat was a pretty big driver behind the initial naming, working with the hardware vendors that all certify on RHEL to find a way of making this persistent. So when you have 10 NICs in a server or more, that it's easy to figure out this NIC that I'm talking to in my code is actually corresponding to that part in the back of the server. So with that in mind, uh, I have not seen a Linux installation for many, many years that did not come with Network Manager. Uh, my best Googling is telling me that that's also the case in Ubuntu uh, and a quite a few other distributions that you really, it's not an option. Uh, you can remove it. It doesn't have to be there for networking to work, but it looks like, just like on Fedora, that when you do a basic installation of Fedora, Network Manager is installed as part of that. If you don't have it, just install Network Manager. The only trick, remember to capitalize the N and M. I don't know why, but 
that always gets me <laughs> um anyway um even if you're not on a GUI so network as I said network manager was initially started by the GNOME project because they had a very concrete need to uh, make it easy for end users to define networking that said even servers can benefit from at least the automation of what to do when a device comes online and offline but there's a lot more and the last part um if you don't have bash complete enable it with network manager it really saves a lot of typing as you go on because it will enumerate devices connections and all that in the right places so you don't have to remember all the exact typings and all that typos and all that so we have two commands that you can optional use with network manager we had nmci which is the command line tool that we're going to be talking about today um, the nmci is pretty much everything that you can do in a GUI and a lot more so it is as pure as it gets as to being able to deal with all features of network manager now NCurses is a, um, a nice little tools that you can use on character screenings to make menus and almost clickable interfaces um, and for some that when you're just starting out that may be the way to get started at least quickly because it just says well you want to add a nick or go here and click there and fill in this little form and you're done instead of having to deal with commands uh, I rarely use it because I can't automate it I can automate NMCLI or either using bash or it's also the interface to use if I use Ansible but for today that pretty much is what I'm going to be talking about wow I can't even hit that button by just anyway so network managers uh, CLI is really much what I'm going to talk about just remember there is a, an additional command the, the TUI tool if you want to play around without getting into the deep that we're going to touch a little bit about today so the CLI can pretty much as I said do everything the network manager can do. we can use it to display edit delete uh, add remove whatever you want to call that <laughs> any kind of connection that is out there um, we can look at we can use it to look at the status of everything on the network side at, in one go or we can look at it uh, and, and these are the two areas of network manager I use the most I can look at devices or I can look at connections and when I write my commands I never write the full device every com every uh, sub command and I'm going to talk about that in a second in network manager you can typically use the first letter it's written so you don't have to write the full uh, context so once you've used it a couple of times you end up using the short words uh, words and it's just much faster to type so NMCLID and NMCLIC is probably what I type the most when I do this one thing to remember though is just because I have network manager doesn't mean the network manager has to manage everything now to me that is what makes the most sense uh, that said it will consider you can tell a network manager whether a device is under its management or not all right so you can basically configure a device to say network manager do not touch this and it will not control it it will not listen to it it will not apply configurations to it and whatever you've done in command line or a script somewhere else is what matters once the system boots it's up to you to reinitialize that interface the connection uh, when we say an uh, uh, MCLI connection what we're talking about there is the connection profiles a configuration of how do we want this network to work there's a few options you can put in front of the object uh, these are not all of them but these are the ones I thought was the most important so terse is a way of, of allowing network managers to spit out a, a very easily computer possible list of data items instead of writing it so it looks nice it can write them in so you can easily pass them with Perl, Python, or even, even Java if, if you want to do that. Uh, field allows you to customize what data items to actually report back. So you don't get a huge long list if all you're looking for is a name or a state or something else, or would be as simple as you just want to know the IP address or something. Uh, but the default is pretty which is the human uh, readable output and it looks pretty damn good on an NC terminal which is the default at least in Fedora and I'll show you some example of those in a second so here are all the main object types 
And as I said, my concentration in most of these are between connection and device. I will touch a little bit on the general side uh, and maybe talk about radio if you guys have questions about it. But I can control net device and connection is how I control my networking. Everything else is about basically the computers or the system's general state. And that can be anything from is this device activated, meaning uh, is the radio turned on on my Wi-Fi? Is it even activated? Does it get power? Or, or where do I want to send debug information to or, or something else like that? Those are all very big global settings that you control using either the general or, for instance, the monitor side. The monitor is a very nice little cool thing where you can follow along all those messages being sent over the wire and what's going on. So because there's a lot of options here, and it's very easy to get help. Now, we all know the man pages, and they absolutely have a ton of information. But to me, the help page that you see here, for instance, for Connect, um, is pretty self-explanatory. With a few exceptions, but if you're not used to it, it might be a couple of what's the difference between ID and not a UID. But beyond that, it's very easy to see that you can view existing connections. You can take them up. You can take them down. You can add, modify, even clone, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is probably where, when I initially have an issue, I will go here. I, I will do the double tap because I get the same list when I do double tap. Uh, NMCLI examples in the man page is another good resource to figure out what options do I have because it's full of examples of how do I create a VLAN, how do I create a static IP, how do I create a DHCP, blah, 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 and how do I make some special options and show you concrete examples of how it's done. Some of the things I'm going to write comes from those examples. And of course, if you do a man network manager, uh, you get the overall manual of the explains for network manager. So, if I do just NMCLI and don't give it any commands at all, that screen you see on the right is what you see. So this is from a server, a virtual server that I created. Um, and as you can see, it tells me that there's one connected uh, interface. It tells me the IP address, tells me the, uh, the local, uh, host, uh, local host interface, which may actually surprise people. It's not managed by Open, uh, OpenShift, sorry, uh, by Network Manager. Um, it's unmanaged because it's static in the sense of it doesn't change. I mean, if local host changes, you have severe problems. It's supposed to come up once and just stay that way all the time. So if you have a ton of net network interfaces, if you guys are interested, I can log on to a server that has, as I said, eight interfaces and show you what it looks like there. But in essence, you get a nice screen with a complete overview of what's on your system. To me, this is almost what I got out of just writing IF config in the olden days, except I am actually looking at what it's supposed to look like as much as I'm looking at the current state. And I get more information here, like route information, than I do with IF config. Now, if I really want to figure out what's really going on, I can say, the general status instead. And that gives me information about everything that it knows about from a network perspective, right? Is it connected? Uh, is it working? Is the Wi-Fi enabled? And is the WAN enabled? And I still don't understand why those last four are enabled, because that was done on a VM that doesn't have Wi-Fi on it. But uh, in general, the connectivity all means that it has, a, it has validated that the network settings you have are valid. So if you have a gateway, it can get to the gateway, it can go, it can get to the DNS servers that you define, et cetera, et cetera. So it knows that the network is working. So that's a very easy way on a server that may not respond correctly to see if there are problems without looking at the exact problems that you have. So device and connections, uh, I, I try to do that in a diagram, right? But it, to me, it's sometimes a little bit hard to wrap why there's two instead of one. Because in essence, I have an interface that has an address. Why do I have two different components in Network Manager to deal with that? And the way I look at it is that the connection is your desired state, and the device is the current state. Uh, now, they're typically the same, but they don't have to be. Depending on how you make the changes, in particular if you did them without telling Network Manager about them, you will see two different things. 
Um, and remember, in the end, the devices are typically a reflection of what's on the kernel side uh, and not really something that you define. A slight warning. When you go in and do a device and you inspect the device, it will sometimes have some sections that looks like configuration data. For instance, it will do a, uh, I have this MTU, I have this address, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was typically being capital letters, which is another way of saying slight, with a slight hint that this is not um, a desired, this is actually what's going on right now. This is the current settings on this device. So even though you can do a show of, of the device and you can get the basic information of, for instance, an IP address, it won't show you all the settings, but it will tell you what that current NIC is doing. Just keep in mind that that is not your desired state, that that may just be something that the system has automatically changed because of an event. Um, for instance, when you do bonds and other things like that, uh, your, your NIC uh, state will change depending on what the switch and it has negotiated, and that may change depending on what happens on a physical level. And you will see those changes in the device show. This is one of my favorite things to do with network manager. So everyone is used to going up in, uh, in one of the corners and, and you look at your Wi-Fi and uh, it will tell you when you turn it on, it will say, well, here's all the Wi-Fi's that exist and you can click on it, it'll ask you for a password and all that, but when you ask, you will often find that people won't know that they can do the same thing here. So in my neighborhood, there's probably about 30 or some Wi-Fi signals that most of them are weak, but I can see them from my house. And so this is the kind of picture you get by just basically saying to network manager, enumerate the Wi-Fi device. So that basically tells it to rescan. And you can see some of these are mine, but then it gets a lot of stuff. And this list is much longer than what this uh, paste is for. But I can see all the stuff that I would do in a GUI on this page, a nice picture. And it even color codes things to sort of indicate this, the signal strength of these devices. Although it has this weird little bar thing on the side that uh, I typically look at. I, I must admit, um, someone had to point out that it was different colors to me. So I just look at the bars, but it sorts it. That this is one of the cool things about this command. Without really telling it, I get the, the strongest signals first, which is typical of the ones I'm most interested in. To connect to a Wi-Fi, it's, again, very simple. I just basically say, check to the Wi-Fi and connect to, and then tell it the SSID that I want to connect to. In this case here, because I didn't tell it what the password should be, it prompts me for the password on a terminal. I did not put that in here because I didn't want to reveal the password. But in essence, that's all I have to do to connect. Uh, but if you really want to do it uh, the hard way, as I call it, um, you can look at the command options that offer that connect, where you can tell it everything from the SSID to what key that do you require. You can even specify the specific IF name, the interface name that you want. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a ton of control. It doesn't just have to be as simple as that. And even better, you can create your own hotspot. Very simple. So if you are, uh, and I've done this quite a lot, you are in a, with a group of people, let's say you're at a hotel, you're, you're preparing to go on site uh, the next day, but everyone needs to sort of get online to, to do some work, but the hotel's Wi-Fi sucks. So this is one way of setting up a laptop or something else to be that hotspot everyone connects to, and then you have one connection to deal with. It's that simple. Most of us deal with wired networks on a server, and, and wired networks is just as easy. Right. So if if I have a interface called Etsy Zero, and again, they can exist. We, we don't necessarily see them that much often anymore. All I have to say is connect to the device, it will automatically create a connection if it doesn't exist, which is uh, set up for automated, meaning uh, DHCP for settings. So if you have a DHCP server, that's literally all you have to write to get a network interface up and running. It's that simple. If I don't have the need for static IPs and all kinds of custom configurations, that's all I have to write. No more, no less. I can disconnect it. 
just like as well as I can connect it, I can get status, I can delete it, etc. I, I can do all those other things that typically we do. Right? So once I've done that, you can see this is an example from my simulator server, sorry, my virtual server. It has two devices and it's connected on one of them only in this case. I, so I, and this may also be an example of this is actually the way predictive interface again. So this is port one on slot zero that it's simulating. Sorry, this is a VM, but it's getting a simulated uh, PCI card, and that's what that PCI card is reporting. However, not all stuff is using DSCP. So here's an example of me adding a connection where I'm from the command line setting up the uh, address right away. So again, I say connect, and in, in this case here, I'm not defining, a, I'm not, in the first place, we'll go back. What I told it was to take the device and create a connection. In this case here, I say take a connection and use this device. See the difference? And in this case, I can uh, it allows me to customize the connection. So because I'm doing this, I say, well, I want to call this private. And again, we go back here. Remember, I had this down here that was disconnected and not in use. So I'm adding a permanent address to that. And it has to be it's a type Ethernet. And then I give it an address and a gateway. In this case here, because this network is non-routable, I don't need to tell DNS and all kinds of other stuff. Um, I did miss out one thing. Uh, I will get back to that in a moment that is not on a command line that I should have put in. But in essence, that did work. Uh, it just didn't work on boot. But we can get into that in a moment. Uh, but that's literally all I need to support. Again, for a simple static IP address, that's all I have to tell it. Now, if you look down here in when it's setting it up, it is saying, telling it is it's getting an IP configuration, which makes no sense because I wanted it to be private. The problem is I didn't tell it to stop using DHCP. I just told it that here's a preferred IP address. So I needed one more setting up here to tell it that the method needs to be manual, and I will show that later on in a different example how to do that. But once that's been defined, I can use the IP command. Uh, I didn't really expect, uh, plan on showing a lot about IP today uh, as the command, but if you have never used it before, it's damn powerful. I'm sorry to, to use that kind of language here, but uh, learn how to use it and you can get, it will solve or help you solve network problems more often than not. And ifconfig does not give you half the data you can get from, from the IP there. But in this case here, I get the input, in, uh, the network up, got the IP address I gave it. Um, of course, with the IP A, I don't see the route, but it has that too. But it also enables by default IPv6. So it gets a lo I think local uh, address. Is NMCI, does it, uh, does NMCLI, is it fully IPv6 uh, you know, capable? Yep, yep, absolutely. So how do we actually see what's going on? So the uh, connection show is the way I would inspect all the settings for a particular connection. Now it spits out a lot of data, actually so much data I couldn't put it on a slide. Um, it, it's a lot of key value pairs. Let me, uh, I'll show that once I'm all done here. We can go in and show some examples. But it comes, data comes in some different sections. There's a connection section that has things like do I automatically connect or under what circumstances should I connect? It's basically like global definitions of what that connection is. Then it has some Ethernet definitions about what type of Ethernet is it and does it behave. Then it has a set of IP6 and IP4 settings and a status section and a few other things coming up. But it's literally like two or three pages of screen stuff dumped on, on your screen for all the options that are in a connection. And depending on what it is you're looking at, whether it's Ethernet or Bridge or VLAN, you will get different sections. So it it does follow. Now you can also use NM uh, CLI to just get one piece of mail. You can query and not get that whole list. But if I only want, for instance, the IP address, I can say the minus G and IP4 dot address, and then 
connection show and in what connection is, and it will only return the IP address and nothing else. So that's another good way of if you do scripting and you just need to retrieve something from the command line, that's one way of, do, of, of doing that. The modify, I'll use the modify instead of show. And it's all key value pairs. So if you know, for instance, that it's IPv4 dot addresses, you can say that it's you know, in key, it is IPv4 dot addresses and the value would be the, uh, the new IP address you want. To edit, I often use the NMCLI C edit instead. And what that does is sort of like gives me a subshell where all I can do is NMCLI commands and hence I can do a print and go around and change the settings and all that. That's not really scriptable, but it allows me to get a quick feedback if I'm typing something wrong. Um, for instance, uh, I've had times where I hit comma instead of decimal point in an IP address, and it will tell me that I, I can't do that when I do it from C edit. So there's a there's a good way of at least when you come out and to diagnose a server to use the, the edit version instead of trying to remember everything by heart or when you do the modify. And I will show some 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 demo here of how we can do this in a moment. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that a network manager allows me to do is to decide who on the system can do what. In particular, we don't assume that users can't define network devices. User can create connections to Wi-Fi and even the Ethernet without needing root access. But we can control or modify, if we want to, what those rights should be. So you may not want those rights on a big server. You may, not, you may, for instance, want to ensure that the system devices on a server cannot be modified by non-privileged users. And that's what you do with the uh, policy kit or the PK action. You can go in and take a look at what they look like and modify them and ensure that devices that you don't want accessed or ma manipulated by others are not accessible. Another cool little feature is the general locking option where you can tell it what debug level the different uh, domains, and we have about 20 different some domains of, of types of locking. So depending on what type of device you have, what kind of hardware you have, there's a different domain for it. So you may not have all of them equally accessible, meaning if you don't have fiber channel in your server, you, you know, using the fiber channel domain doesn't really help you much. <laughs> But it is there by definition as a as part of the code, but you won't get any results out of it. But as you can see, if I have a problem I want to debug, I can literally turn up the on debug level on, for instance, or layer one and layer two for my actually layer three with IP for for standard IP addresses, and I can then see what network manager does in details and what it gets back at those levels in my logs. So the next few slides are going to be about a little more than advanced uh, than just setting up an IP address. Again, I can show as uh, I can show systems in practical how this is done uh, because I have all this stuff running on all my servers so that I use in every day. So if you want to see a practical example how these things look, uh, I can show those. But let's take a look at bunding. So if you are running a server in a deep, big data center, you most likely already know what this is. But just in case you did not know what a bond is or what a team is, that when we have communication between servers, and for instance, we want to make sure that uh, we don't suffer an outage just because one thing fails. Right? So cables can fail, uh, switch ports can fail. Uh, I mean, any device that every piece of hardware that you have technically can fail. A lot of times it fails because a stupid human does something, but any device can, can fail. So what one of the things we can do is to say, well, instead of just having one wire between the servers or between the server and the switch, I want to have two wires. And in case one wire no longer works, automatically switch over to the other one. And that's called active backup. So what this does, if you see on the side, is I set up a bond um, and that's just basically creating a new interface called my bond AC. This is a new device that is not really physical that I created. And then I basically tell it to, um, uh, 
uh, I've been part of a long, long discussion about whether we can call it things masters and slaves so these days, but uh, this is a network slave, <laughs> sorry, uh, that literally says that this bond consists of these two network interfaces. And this protocol tells it which one of these two to use depending on which one is available. Uh, and that's pretty much as simple as you can. This doesn't even require any set, us, set up on the switch. The new way of doing this, so bond is the way old uh, stuff that I used back in rail four and five. So it's not that modern anymore. And it has been preceded by Team D, uh, uh, Team Demon, which has a lot more advanced features uh, available. Um, I really won't, this was not a matter of going into details. I, I put I did a, a link down here if you want to see the details of what uh, Team D can do and how you configure it. It's quite advanced. As you can see, one of the things that it will often need is a JSON file that specifies the advanced settings of how does this team of NICs work together, what protocols to use on the uh, timeouts, all kinds of stuff you can define in there. You cannot do that with bonds. So it's by far, if, you, if you're setting up a new server today, use Team. But in the essence, it does the same thing. But in the end, it allows you to set up a master and have multiple slaves on it. Now, it doesn't have to be a back actor backup. It can be anything from uh, LACPD um, or LACP, which is a switch protocol that splits out all sessions or multiple NICs. So you literally have more bandwidth to go out. Now, not per session, but if you have a server running lots of VMs and you may not. You may have from all the VMs more than one. Your standard one uh, megabits per second coming through. You can spread all that that traffic coming out or multiple NICs very easily. It does require advanced switches, but it allows for better things. Or you can do a very simple round robin um, on the switch, which also requires a managed switch. But those are the, are the cheaper ones. VLAN is. To me, one of the key aspects, when you do network enterprise-wise, you're most likely going to be exposed to VLAN. So it's a way of dividing a physical switch into smaller switches. And even better, it's a way of connecting multiple switches together as if they were uh, a lot of smaller switches. So they're all isolating traffic between them, looking like separate networks. Setting up a VLAN is one of the simple things. Uh, doing this the old way always caused me trouble. A uh, network manager has made that extremely easy. So you define a VLAN, again, just like we did with the team. And so we set a T name, and you can basically say that it's, you know, this VLAN is going to this device, it's using ID 10, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then I can go in, and this is how you can modify by script, adding an, ID, an address, a gateway, a DNS. And in this case here, this is the one I did not have in my example. The IPv4 methods to manual because the default is auto. Now, if you use the NMCLIC edit and you tell it, I want to add a manual address, it tells you, uh, you want auto, uh, would you like to change that to manual? And you say yes, and it's doing it for you. Um, if you don't do the edit, then you have to manually remember to do it. Otherwise, it will still try to use DHCP and only fall back to your IP address if that fails, which could be what you want to do. So here's an example of one of my servers uh, that I use in a lab that uses a VLAN. And the way we know, well, I, I use the name VLAN to make it simple. But I can also see by name out here the dot 20 is the, the VLAN ID that I'm using. on. You can actually see that it is built on top of a team that is spread over three NICs. So I can nest these things together at any level that I want. So you know, I start with a physical network, team them together, put them on VLAN, I could then put a VPN or something else on top of that. It, it doesn't have to be, hey, only one layer on top of it. Speaking of VPN, um, many years ago, this is really what got me, I would say, excited about Network Manager. Because initially, I saw the GUIs and I didn't really care about how they were implemented. 
I must admit, because I didn't do it myself, I did not know what the developers were going through, and it didn't strike me until I talked to some of them or read about it that they actually did not find it that easy to do. But I had a big problem initially. When I used the VPN, it killed my DNS in my local lab. And most of my work involves doing demos or setting up simulated things that I talk to a customer about, and I use my lab for that a lot. And all of a sudden, whenever I connected to the company VPN, I lost all access to my lab, and that didn't really work. So for a long time, I you know I would connect to the VPN, do my hit the work sites, and then I would disconnect from that, use my my lab. It was like back and forth, back and forth, not fun. I then found the sec the option called DNS equals to DNS mask in Network Manager. And now Network Manager. Uh, using DNS mask as the implementer, literally controls what happens when I connect to the DNS, sorry, to my VPN, and it will then try a DNS resolution first on my, in, the, in the VPN DNS. If that doesn't work, it will try my local DNS too. So all of a sudden now, even when I'm on VPN, I can still access my local lab um, and not, I mean, that saved me so much time and frustration that it just like, I went, wow, this is something I need to learn more about. And eight years later or something like that, now I'm doing a little talk about it. To activate a VPN, again, uh, if you're in the GUI, you most likely gone down, hit the little on button on the VPN definition, and it comes up maybe asking you for a password, and you're, you're connected. You can do the same thing from the command line by using the ask. So basic in this case here, that just tells Network Manager to prompt you on the terminal for the password. And it says, take this connection up, that is my VPN definition. To define VPN connections, now a lot of that has to deal with a lot of data, like certificates and stuff like that. So typically we have a little file somewhere. It's usually less than 20 lines, but it usually is a file that may have references to other files like certs that you can use. So in this case here, let's say I downloaded a file from my company that says, here's the VPN for OpenVPN. And in order for me to use that with Network Manager, I just import it into Network Manager. Um, oh, I can do the hard way. I can define my connection and give it all the options about what interface to use, what permissions to use, what type of VPN it is, the point to point in this case, where the gateway is, et cetera. And then it will also configure it this way. The, this is a very simple VPN. It doesn't have a lot of authorization. This would definitely not work in most of the places I've done VPN. It's not secure enough, but it is possible to do that way too. And bridges. So if you run VMs today on Linux, you're using bridges. You just don't necessarily know about it or care about it. Um, but one of the things that I've done in most of my servers that does hypervisors at the very least is to have at least one bridge, sometimes more than that. And all the bridge is basically allowing me to do is to have one device being represented by one or more underlying devices. But um, so it allows me to basically define a way of saying, well, here are my VMs. They have their own internal network they think about, but it's actually part of this bigger network in the rest of the um, system. So it allows the VMs to see the whole network as if they were plugged into it directly. That's what it means by bridging. They are bridging that local idea into the bigger one, and they're sort of connected that way. So that allows me to basically take my hypervisor and uh, uh, expose all my VMs as if they were standard physical boxes on that network. In, in most cases, if you just have a laptop run VMs, it's behind the NAT gateway, and it's literally not going to be part of your bigger network, and that may be on, on purpose, and then you won't use a bridge for that. Although you can. You can also set up the bridge to just use an app. But again, you define your bridge, and you add, again, the word slave here. Uh, I may start changing my slides because I'm being told by people I need to listen to more that bad name to use. But it's basically just telling it that this interface is a built-in component of this other interface. And you can have more than one interface per bridge, not a problem. There's really not magic. 
Uh, Network Manager, I like what, what Ted was saying earlier. It, it, when it first came out, uh, because of all this automation of uh, responding to events and people with servers tended to think very statically, that that was the first, well, if you can't make it work because it keeps changing your stuff, uh, just turn it off. Um, I would not do that, uh, at least not today. Now, there are situations where some systems are designed with the presumption that this thing does not change. I mean, the networks can't go up and down unless they have, you know, another piece of software is doing that, not network manager. And in that case, you may end up having a system where network manager is not managing NICs, but instead of uninstalling it, just make those NICs not manageable by network manager. That still allows you to have that commonality interface or code that may need to query the state of an interface and all that stuff implement. Um, to me, because there's not only so much help, but it, the auto tap complete works, so much easier to remember what to do because I don't have to remember all the settings or go to a manual somewhere to remember that this variable set like this means that, but in our context, it means something else. And the fact that when I plug in a network card, or sorry, uh, and you know, if I have a server and the and the plug, let's say I um, I plug in a new a new NIC, it will automatically activate. I don't have to do anything. I can turn that off if I want to, but because it responds to automatic hardware events, it makes dealing with hardware so much easier. But that's about it. Um, trying to keep it within an hour, and I'm almost only over by 10 minutes, I think. Um, I really wanted, I, well, there was one or two questions here, but I wanted to make sure I had enough room for questions and demos and stuff like that. So without further ado, so here is, here's my demo server. Quick question before I leave, Peter. Um, so one of my projects that I'm gonna be trying to do is trying to do, uh, set up two Linux boxes and do uh, TCP IP over ham radio between two two different boxes. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone here has experience with 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 TCP IP over, over ham. My, my father-in-law is a ham, but he's not experienced in Linux. So it's kind of a project we're doing together, but I was thinking about once I get this running that I could maybe demo that you know, for the group as to how I set all that up. Does anyone else have any experience in the area? Is that something people would be interested in, in knowing how to do? I'll be interested. I have no experience whatsoever, but I would definitely love to see that. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite interesting. Um, uh, you know, the bandwidth is fairly low, so like, you know, you need to use something like Mosh or something like that, probably if you wanted to wanted to work between two boxes. But uh, I'll go ahead and um, uh, I'll get, I'll I'll write you a, an email or and or you or Ted just once I figure out how long it's going to take me to do, and uh, we'll set up a time where I can do a demo for everyone. Yeah, uh, we would actually do that in the military using uh, terrestrial radios. Um, when we were, when, if, if we had a, we would usually use it for humanitarian relief efforts. Um, oh, but yeah. Up and, and do uh, TCP IP over terrestrial radios. Well, it's interesting, uh, not to get into the weeds, but um, I was doing, the reading that I've read this far, actually, you can actually just do it over your sound card going into, the, I guess, the, the ham radio device nowadays. You know, if you've got an input and output on your computer, you don't need fancy cards, you know, mm -hmm. or anything like that. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and, and dive into that. Um, and uh, but once I get that, once I've, once I figure I understand it, then, then I'll put together a presentation and we can do stuff from, for the for the group. But that's it's networking related, so it'd be interesting to see yeah. how that works. You know, well, something similar where it was video over laser. Ah, I don't have any lasers to use though. That was kind of cool. It was uh, <laughs> <laughs> how to how to broadcast a video signal to a, a very long distance. You had to set the laser up so that it was uh, being received on the receiving end just right. But I've never tried it. I don't I don't have any lasers, but it would have been cool. <laughs> I, I, I have lasers, but they're not that powerful. <laughs> <laughs> you're like yay big, so no. <laughs> The only laser I have I have any experience with was back in the early in the mid aughts when I was in my early career at the National Science Foundation. 
we were setting up our, our network to Internet 2, to connect to Internet 2, and the only way to do that was via point-to-point -point laser between two buildings because because Verizon wouldn't let us talk, tear up the, the ground and, and lay down fiber. So we had to use, a, a you know, like a like an OC3, you know, over laser between two. But the problem is when it rained, you got a rain attenuation and then, then the connection would drop out. So it wasn't that reliable in heavy rain, only heavy rain. Only heavy rain. Yeah. Light rain didn't affect it, but heavy rain did. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I got to go. Thank you much, and I'll keep, I'll keep you in touch. It would be a fun topic for a talk, you know, being able to oh, do yeah. IP or video over some weird device. Oh, yeah, absolutely. See you yeah. later. All right, cool. Have a good weekend. So, anyway, I, I brought this demo up just in case there was uh, specific things that we want to see, but here's a command. So again, this is the demo server that I did some of the examples that I just talked about on. So I have two NICs in here. One is the connected one uh, that is connected to basic real network. And the other one is a fake network that doesn't go anywhere, but it allows me to do demos. So here's the command that you saw in one of the earlier slides that will basically add a connection to this interface. And it will tell it it's an IPv4, give it an address, give it a gateway. Now that I have that, as you can see, it's connected. I have addresses and all that. And if you want to, I want to show you the, um, um, the reason that I talked about all the options, right? So if I go in and say, uh, that wasn't correct, private, there we go. So let me finish this up here. Oh, right. So it's giving me 111 pieces of data that I can require uh, retrieve. This is all the data the network manager is tracking and following on this particular connection that I just set up. And often what I'm interested in is just a couple of these values. Now, the ID can come, become very important in the script, but the type uh, and all that, I always say for granted, the Ethernet, I don't really think about it too much. Uh, but autoconnect is probably the most important to me. And make sure that the interface comes up and boot. That's literally what it means. Whenever it sees the device come up, start automatically connecting. So autoconnect is not just on boot. It is literally also meaning if someone plugs in the cable in the back. And uh, if there's more than one definition of connections on that interface, which one comes first? Give it a quality. But I, most of the cases, I just look for that because I, for my hardware, I only have one connection in most cases. It also can tell you what zone firewall in firewall D you're attached to. So that is also important. Other than that, I really only concentrate for IPv4 for the options that I really look at. And that's really the ones I remember. So everything from what DNS servers do I want to do? And again, this was a private network, so it's not there. But if I went to the other one, you will see that it actually has, oh, it's, it's DSP, so it doesn't show DNS here. It shows them down here. So it tells it that the DNS server here is that. So this is one of the cool things. Again, if it's capital, it's usually a derived current state of where things are coming from. Um, so in essence, when I want to change something, I can do an NMCLIC edit, and then I can say private. And in this case here, it tells me that, holy moly, you know, you can actually do all kinds of things. Um, as you saw, I have all these different sections. If I say print, basically telling me that each of these sections like connection, the Ethernet, blah, 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 all are now available to be edited. Uh, now, it's a little bit strange that it thinks certain features are there, even though the hardware doesn't support it. But I think the code is just basically saying, hey, you took a connection, and these are all the potential type of sections you could see, regardless of type. So if I want to edit something from in here, um, there's two ways of doing that. But basically, I can say, is it IPv4? Let's do the DNS just for the fun of it. Let's say this. Right. 
If I do a print IPv4, you can now see that it added that DNS. And here comes the, the, the bulk of it. When you use edit, if you don't save it, then uh, it's kind of like just doing it in memory. Uh, that's number one. Saving it just saves the state. You need to tell Network Manager to activate the change, basically like commit it. So this allows you to do a lot of changes without having it try to commit it to the network every time you do a line. Right? So I need to say activate in order to make that change active on the system. And now if I go out and look at my resolve, there's that uh, name show that I added from the other network. So um, NMCLIC edit is a debug tool that I use quite often. When I want a script, I use either Ansible or I would go in and do the where you add all the parameters, just like you saw here on the long command line, like that. This is the way you could say in a script, just create a new connection or add this or add a bridge and all that stuff. Do it all from a single command. And by far the simpler way to automate things. So if I have 10 servers to configure, I don't need to repeat it manually every time. Any particular things anyone wants to see around Network Manager or maybe some of the, like the IP command that we look at that was, I didn't say that, I, sorry, that I said I wouldn't really go into details with or something else around networking on the command line that I may not have touched on, touched on. A lot of people here, so. Ilana on here and Tom. That's about it. It's just, other than that, it's just Ted me and more people. So, Ilana and Tom, in case you guys have questions, speak up. Otherwise, I think we can call it a, um, a, a Fredlock day. I'll stop the recording.